This pond is full of millions of tiny organisms, too small to be seen with the naked eye. The mouth of this dog contains a wide range of organisms called bacteria. Even though you can't see them, dozens of different kinds of tiny living things live in this single drop of water taken from this wetland. And the blood coming from this cut contains thousands of tiny cells. How do we know about all these different living things? And how is it possible for scientists, and even you as a science student, to observe these fascinating living things? The answer lies in the use of a remarkable tool, the microscope. What exactly is a microscope? Simply put, a microscope is an instrument that makes small objects look larger. A microscope produces an enlarged image of something that might otherwise be too small to be seen with the naked eye. During the next few minutes, we're going to take a look at some of the different types of microscopes, and we're going to discuss how you can effectively and safely use a microscope in your science classroom. But first, let's take a quick look at the development of early microscopes. Until the late 1500s, it wasn't possible to see very small objects, such as cells. In fact, people weren't even sure if cells existed. In 1590, the invention of the microscope enabled people to look at very small objects never before seen. Early microscopes consisted of simple lenses inserted in a tube. The first compound light microscopes consisted of a tube with a lens at each end. We'll talk more about compound light microscopes later. In 1663, the English biologist Robert Hooke improved on the design of early microscopes, thus enabling him to make one of the most important discoveries in the history of biology. By cutting a very thin slice of cork, and placing the section under a microscope, he made an important discovery. You decide. What are these structures Hook saw? These structures are cork cells. The discovery of cells served as the basis for other scientists, such as Antony von Leeuwenhoek and Matthias Schleiden, to develop a more thorough understanding of cells, which we now know are the basic unit of life. Microscopes have played a critical role in helping scientists further our understanding of not only cells, but of other living and non-living things too small to be seen with the naked eye. Today, scientists have access to a wide range of different kinds of microscopes. These microscopes vary in the level of complexity, cost, and the type of work they can perform. Perhaps you've seen a microscope similar to this in your science classroom. This type of microscope is generally referred to as a compound light microscope. Compound light microscopes have more than one lens and use light to magnify an object. Using a single lens, a magnifying glass produces an image a few times larger than an object. But a compound microscope uses two or more lenses to create an image that is up to 1,000 times larger than the actual object. Another type of microscope you may have seen in your science classroom is called a stereo microscope. This type of microscope is similar to a compound light microscope, but it's used to closely study large objects, such as rocks, flowers, and other kinds of living things. A very sophisticated type of microscope that has greater ability to magnify objects is called the electron microscope, as seen here. Instead of light, the electron microscope 
sends a beam of tiny particles called electrons over the surface of a specimen to create an image. This creates a detailed three-dimensional image of the surface of a specimen and can enlarge it up to 150,000 times. Scanning electron microscopes are quite expensive and are found at universities and other institutions that conduct scientific research. Another type of electron microscope, called the transmission electron microscope, actually passes electrons through a very thinly sliced specimen. Because this microscope can enlarge a specimen up to 500,000 times its actual size, it's very useful for studying the internal structures of cells. This is what the image of a compound microscope looks like without light. And here's the image with the light on. As you can see, light is essential for a compound light microscope to work properly. Magnification is the ability to make things appear larger than they actually are. Lenses are essential for the magnification of specimens. A close look at a lens, such as the one in a magnifying glass, reveals that the lens is not flat, but is thicker in the middle than at the edges. When light passes through the lens, it's bent and magnified, making the object appear larger than it really is. In a compound light microscope, light passes up through a specimen and then through two or more lenses before reaching the eye. The total magnification of the microscope is computed by multiplying the magnification of the different lenses. For example, let's say that the magnification of the lower lens is 40 and the magnification of the upper lens is 10. You compute. What's the total magnification? That's right, by multiplying 10 by 40, we get a total magnification of 400. This means that these bacteria are magnified 400 times their actual size. Each part of a car has a specific name and function. It's useful to know the name of the part and to understand the job it performs. The same holds true for the compound light microscope in your science classroom. Let's take a minute to discuss the parts of the microscope. The base supports the microscope and keeps it stable. The base is attached to the arm. The arm supports the body tube seen here. Near the base is the light source or mirror. If a mirror is used, it's necessary to use a light which the mirror reflects upward through the specimen. If an actual light is present, an on-off switch is adjacent to it. This flat black area is called the stage. The stage supports the slide being viewed. In the middle of the stage is a hole which allows for the passage of light originating from below. Beneath the stage is a mechanism called the diaphragm. The diaphragm is an adjustment which controls the amount of light passing through the opening of the stage. These silver tubes are lenses called objective lenses. This particular microscope has four objective lenses. On the side of each objective lens is a number. This lens has a number four. You decide. What do you think the four means? That's right. The four means this lens has a magnification of four times, also referred to as four power. The smallest objective is sometimes referred to as the low power objective. In this case, the four power objective is the low power objective.
and the larger objective is sometimes referred to as the high power objective. This silver circular structure is called the nose piece. The nose piece holds the objective lenses above the stage and rotates them so different objective lenses may be used. The nose piece is attached to the body tube. The body tube separates the nose piece from the eye piece and allows for the passage of light from below. The eyepiece lens on this particular microscope has a magnification of 10. This large circular knob is the course adjustment. The course adjustment moves the stage in bigger increments to bring the specimen into focus. It's designed to be used when using the low power objective. The smaller knob is called the fine adjustment and is used when focusing the high power objective. The microscopes in your science classroom are some of the most expensive and delicate tools in your school. Microscopes are built to last many years, but only if they're used carefully and correctly. Before using the microscope, create a clean and clear workspace, free of books, bags, clothing, and food. When carrying the microscope, always use two hands. Grasp the arm of the microscope with one hand and place the other hand under the base. Place the microscope well back from the edge of the table with the arm toward you. Plug in the microscope. Using the course adjustment, increase the distance between the stage and the objective lenses. Rotate the nose piece until the lowest power objective, the shortest lens, clicks into place and is aligned over the hole in the stage. Look through the eyepiece and carefully adjust the diaphragm so the maximum amount of light is coming through the nose piece. Obtain a prepared slide from your teacher. Keep in mind that slides are made of glass. If they're dropped even a short distance, they'll break. Carefully place the slide on the stage and position it under or between the stage clips while positioning the portion of the slide containing the specimen over the hole in the stage. Once you've positioned the slide, look at the stage from the side. While looking through the eyepiece, very slowly raise the stage by turning the course adjustment knob until the specimen comes into focus. Let's say you want to get a closer look of the specimen. In other words, you want to increase the magnification by switching to a higher powered objective. Once again, look at the stage from the side. Carefully rotate the nose piece until the high power objective lens clicks into place. Be very careful the lens does not touch the slide as it may break the slide and damage the lens. Turn the fine adjustment a very small amount to bring the specimen into focus. This is the letter E as seen under low power. Notice that it appears upside down. You observe. What do you observe through the eyepiece when we move the slide to the left? As you can see, when the slide is moved to the left, it looks like it's moving to the right through the eyepiece. This is a strange thing to get used to when working with the compound light microscope. Images as seen under the microscope appear upside down and backward. Another thing to keep in mind while using the microscope is that the brightest light, or most amount of light, is not always the best to use. The diaphragm controls the amount of light going through a specimen. Experiment with the control of the diaphragm to see how varying amounts of light affect your view of the specimen. Quite often, less light creates a greater contrast, enabling you to see structures not visible with large amounts of light.
Some microscopes also contain an adjustment controlling the intensity of light. One exciting thing to do with a microscope is to view specimens collected on your own. Your instructor can show you how to collect specimens and to create a wet mount with a clean slide and a cover slip. During the past few minutes, we've taken a look at some of the fascinating aspects of microscopes. We began by discussing some of the features of early microscopes and how they were instrumental in developing early knowledge of microscopic life. We also talked about some of the different types of microscopes, including the scanning electron microscope and the transmission electron microscope. More specifically, the safe use of compound light microscopes was demonstrated. The parts of the compound light microscope and their function were also highlighted. Finally, we pointed out some helpful hints in using the microscope. So the next time you use a microscope in your school science lab, think about some of the things we discussed during the past few minutes. You just might think about microscopes a little differently. Fill in the correct word to complete the sentence. Good luck, and let's get started. Number one. Robert Hooke used a microscope to discover... Number two. An microscope uses a stream of electrons to create an image. Number three, this is a light microscope. Number four, are used to magnify a specimen in this microscope. Number five, is the ability to make things appear larger. Number six, this flat black area is the Number seven, these silver tubes are lenses. Number eight, this large knob is the adjustment. Number nine, always use hands when carrying a microscope. And number 10, images under the microscope appear down and backward. <laughs> 